Hey everyone, welcome back. <clears throat> Today we're going over chapter 7, Water and Minerals. For me, this is one of the more fun chapters. I like a lot of the things that we talk about. There's going to be quite a bit of information in this, uh, in this slideshow, so bear with me. I'm going to do my best to not um, linger too long on certain slides or on certain concepts and really make sure that I'm prepping you for the test. Um, but also making sure that I give you some good information. We have quite a few learning objectives today. Uh, explain the functions of water in the body, including how much fluid you need to drink each day. Discuss the pros and cons of choosing various types of beverages, including the effects of caffeine-containing beverages. Identify characteristics of minerals, including which minerals are, minerals are low in the American diet. Identify functions... <clears throat> food sources, and possible deficiency concerns of calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, iron, zinc, and iodine. So the, those are all minerals that I just laid out. Identify function and food sources of sodium and, and problems caused by sodium overconsumption. Prepare and present menu items using nuts and seeds. That one is very, very minimal at the end. Um, I could have included more, but I just wanted to make sure that I got you the information that you needed to prepare you best for the test. But we can always talk about more menu items using nuts and seeds in the future. All right, so we're starting with water. This is our number one nutrient because we can only use, live a few days without it. So we can go much longer without food something like a month, maybe it's even longer and I just haven't read up on it lately. Um, but water, it's, I know it's the slide says a few days, but really it's like pretty on average only three days. So it's definitely, we need water intake. And if you're someone who's like, that's weird. I don't even drink water that much. How is it then that I'm fine? We can also get water from different, from various beverages. So like, for example, Soda has water, carbonated water in it. It's not a good, I wouldn't say it's a good source of water, but because it has water, your body will use whatever is put into the body. Um, and then we also have water that comes from food. So food gives us a little bit of water. Um, but so we do get water in various ways. The number one way I think of consuming water is just plain as is. And for some of you, you might be thinking, ew, that's gross. Um, so maybe we'll have to discuss some ways of making the water interesting. There's carbonated water, sparkling water, there's, um, and you can get those with some enhanced flavors, but I personally just like plain. Um, I know some people like LaCroix, that brand. Um, there's also Perrier. I really like it. It is on the expensive side. So what other things that I would do to just, um, spice up, if you will, water is slice, um, for, uh, fresh citrus. So slices of lime, lemon, orange, grapefruit. You can also do sprigs of fresh herbs such as rosemary or mint. Uh, you can also add fresh fruit to your water um, such as berries. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we can consume water and make it more fun, <laughs> uh, more tasty. Um, okay, so the cells in our body are full of water. So it's really important that we keep it hydrated, but as we go on, you'll see all the cool functions of water that you probably didn't think about. I know I don't, I, that you probably don't think about, and I know I didn't think about them until after I had taken a nutrition course. So the average adult weight is 50 to 60% water, which fun fact, the earth is about 60 to 70% water, which is really interesting as well. I'm like, ooh, that's an interesting correlation between the body and the, and the earth, just saying. Um, men have proportionally more water than women um, because they have more muscle. I don't know about have, yeah, I guess so, cells. But I would say also require more water. <clears throat> so here are the functions of water. It serves as the medium for many metabolic activities such as digestion and absorption. Water carries nutrients to all to the cells and carries away waste. Uh, over 90% of blood is water. Water in blood helps to maintain a normal temperature and removes heat and sweat. Pretty cool. Um, it lubricates the body, different parts of the body. Water helps cushion the joints and internal organs. So part of that lubrication part. 
Water keeps tissues in your eyes, lungs, and air passages moist. That's what we need that for those environments. Uh, and it surrounds and protects the fetus during pregnancy. So I really want you to pay attention to the slide. Please learn everything that's on this slide because uh, questions will be based off of this slide. So how much water do you need? Um, so this is like a general rule of thumb that women meet, need 2.7 liters per day and men need 3.7 liters per day. So it's just a really good estimate. I don't really like this, but if this is easier for you to think about um, in cups versus liter, um, women need at least nine cups. So what does nine cups mean? It's not just like I'm going to grab a cup out of my cupboard. Cup is referring to eight ounces. So nine times eight, 72 ounces. So um, that's how many, if you're an ounces person or if you're a cups person, that's one way to think about it. Um, and then um, 12 cups for uh, water for um, men. And here it says fluid, but I'm just more so like, let's just get water because your body can utilize it right then and there. Um, when you start drinking other drinks that have sugar or other things that are in them, it's, it's really about maintaining your hydration levels. So yeah, I, I, I put a little note, do not confuse with coffee. The book uses coffee cups. I guess that's like Americans drink a lot of coffee. I don't know. And so they thought this might be a better way to represent it. But when I look at these cups, I don't think eight ounces and I don't think 12 ounces. I think 16 ounces. I'm When I see this, I think about a 16 ounce cinnamon dolce latte that I like to order. So this is just a visual for cups. Although I would have just used like a measuring cup or something. Okay, so water balance. When healthy, the body maintains water at a constant level. Thirst helps you to do that. Um, but we are, we're not, a lot of us aren't in tune with our, uh, with our body. So a lot of us aren't really in tune with when we're thirsty or when we're hungry. So um, a better way I think about thinking about that is keeping a water bottle with you. I have a reusable water bottle. Um, don't get anything that's um, plastic though. Um, so utilizing plastic um, containers can over time potentially increase our different hormone levels, one of those being estrogen. And for men and women, we don't want high estrogen levels. We just want regular estrogen levels. So definitely avoid um, plastic containers. So if you're going to do something that's plastic, make sure it's BPA free. I personally go for stainless steel. Um, Clean Canteen is a great brand. And some of you might be thinking this is really expensive and you're probably right. So you can always go with a different brand, but I highly recommend stainless steel. Um, but the other thing too is um, it's completely up to you how you want to invest in your health or in your body or whatever your investments are. I invest in, I invested in one water bottle that I have had for 10 years. So in the long run, my $30 water bottle, I'm not even going to attempt to break that down into the number of days. But at this point, it's lived way beyond what I paid for it. So it's completely up to you um, how you want to consume your water. That's just what I would recommend. You need more fluids when it is hot, when you're engaged in strenuous activity, or when you lose fluids due, due to vomiting or diarrhea. And then as, you, as we age, our ability to de detect or feel when we're thirsty declines. Our body gets rid of water through our kidneys, our skin, and our lungs, believe it or not, especially us living in a drier um, atmosphere that is Las Vegas, the desert. Um, we're going to need more water. So here are some different ways that you can consume water. I already right, mentioned regular water. Um, you can drink it from the tap. It is uh, it is um, clean. I have a friend that uh, after she got her master's and I think it was a chemical engineering. She's so smart and amazing. Um, that's one of the things she did was work at the water plant here in Las Vegas. So actually our water is good. But some of us um, maybe don't feel that way. So you can use a filter on the tap water. I think that... Um, investing in a filter that you only have to change out every three months is the most efficient way to go about consuming water if you're not going to be drinking from the tap. Again, um, I would refrain from drinking from plastic water bottles. I know a lot of us tend to do that. Um, I know my family uh, tends to do that, but um, 
we want to be careful about drinking out of plastic bottles, as I said, that are not BPA free. And the only reason I know that is because um, one of my family members who's a male had recently got his blood work done and his estrogen levels were high. Um, this is also what studies show. And um, his that's what his doctor had recommended to not be drinking from plastic water bottles. So occasionally, sure, but maybe not making it in an every day or every week habit. So you can drink um, spring or artesian water, mineral water, purified water, which is what I was talking about, sparkling water, um, such as seltzer water, tonic water, or club soda. And it says soda, but it doesn't have any, um, it doesn't have any uh, sugar in it. So here's, an, um, here's a list of functional beverages. I mean, very rarely do people say functional beverages, but it is a term. Um, whenever somebody says a functional beverage, they're referring to um, ingredients that are added that say that there's specific health benefits um, or some kind of benefit beyond, um, beyond like what the mixture would. So, gosh, I guess we just needed to come up with a category for drinks that are not soda and are also not water so <laughs> um examples include sports drinks energy drinks and enhanced teas fruit drinks um you might think of v8 um waters so you might think of vitamin water um containing vitamins minerals phytochemicals and or herbs so we just have a group or a category for functional beverages so um, one thing I want you to remember on the test is um, if you see a question that asks about a functional food, energy drink with ginseng is a very possible choice there. I just want to make sure I didn't throw you off because here I do say energy drink, but I don't say necessarily with ginseng. Um, so a lot of times that's uh, energy drinks or different enhanced functional or enhanced drinks often use some kind of gimmick to help you think that, oh, this is healthier, oh, this is better. Um, so that's one of the things is saying made with ginseng. Um, so because it's very popular, I decided to put it on the test. So in case you see a question about a functional food or a fun functional beverage, an energy drink with ginseng is a plausible uh, ex answer. <clears throat> So sports drinks, I recommend diluting them. We really don't need um, a lot. Uh, we really don't need sports drinks. I mean, yeah, there are some athletes that sweat profusely and are um, engaging in back-to-back -back games. So a little bit of sugar with a little bit of electrolytes such as salt um, and potas so sodium, potassium, and chlorine um, can be helpful, but, um, uh, sorry, chloride. Um, but most of us who are not sweating profusely, who are not engaged in strenuous physical activity, big, vigorous act, uh, exercise that lasts at least 60 minutes, um, we do not need that. This is just extra sugar and extra calories in our diet that is serving no purpose. Um, so I put in this little meme, what body part are you hitting today? It's thumbs day every day. So... That's how typically our exercise goes, so we're definitely not in that category to drink a sports drink. So energy drinks, these um, tend to contain varying amounts of caffeine. Sometimes they have plant-based st stimulants, like, like I'd mentioned, uh, ginseng or guana, I think is how you say it. Um, safety issues, um, this is something I also put on the test because I know that, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> I know that some of you might have family members or friends that do things like mix Red Bull and vodka. It's actually really not recommended. So on the test, I included this um, not to drink an energy drink with alcohol. So safety issues, it is dangerous to mix energy drinks with alcohol. And it's also very risky for children to be drinking energy drinks. They're very sensitive to caffeine and so um, it's it's not recommended. <clears throat> Um, so other enhanced, these are, this is, uh, excuse me, this is a slide with more enhanced drinks that we don't need to go over. Okay. This is just some examples of things to look at functional beverages. Honestly, I, I'm just, I, I'm just a plain Jane go with water kind of a person. If you have questions about them, please ask me. 
like I said, if you want to consume phytochemicals and antioxidants, you're better off eating whole foods with them, such as fruits and vegetables. Can I get an amen, please? Thank you. All right, so now we're moving on to caffeine, which is one of my favorite um, topics because I love, 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 love coffee. Um, I do, I'm trying to get into tea. Um, I would just rather drink water. Like tea is not, I'm off, I'm just really not a tea person, but I'm trying to get into tea because my husband and my, um, one of my little brothers is very into tea and both are becoming like tea connoisseurs. Uh, they even bought like a high tech kettle and one fought like, bought like an, I don't know, another cool kettle. I don't know. So anyways, if you're, um, we can consume caffeine in, in various forms. We'd mentioned energy drinks, coffee and tea or other op, uh, options as well. Um, so these are just some true or false. Um, you can find the answers in the book, but it's kind of fun. I typically do that in class to just see what everybody thinks and then go through the answers together. So caffeine is a naturally occurring stimulant found in plants such as the coffee bean, tea leaf, cola nut, and cacao bean. Um, moderate use of caffeine is fine. What moderate is defined is defined as is up to 400 milligrams or about four cups, which is and when we say cups, we mean eight fluid ounces of coffee daily. And when we're talking about coffee, we're talking about, um, I believe the right term is drip coffee. I want to say pour over as well um, because this is based off of a brewed cup of coffee. So we're not talking about espresso um, when we're talking about 400 milligrams or how many cups. Um so you'll have to look up how much a shot of espresso has. Um, and I could be mistaken, but I think it's around 150 milligrams, I want to say, of caffeine. I could be wrong. It could be closer to 100. So definitely look that up if you're curious about what your caffeine intake is. Um, I am sheltered in place, as I know most of us are. And so I brew my own coffee at home just using drip coffee, a Mr. Coffee Pot, very basic and I have on average 16 ounces. Um, sometimes I bump it up to three cups. Very rarely I hit four cups. Um, for some of us that might take a while to get back down to as some of us have maybe become com dependent on um, coffee. I know that's very common for us college students. Caffeine stimulates the nervous and the cardiovascular system. It improves mood, decreases fatigue, and increases attentiveness, which I'm sure you've all experienced. If you yourself are a coffee drinker and didn't get that coffee that you needed that day, or if you have encountered someone else who's an avid coffee drinker who did not get their caffeine that day. So for the test, I want you to remember that um, uh, moderate caffeine um, is 400 milligrams or about four cups of coffee a day. So I do want you to remember that for the test. I also want you, so here you see the moderate use of caffeine, four cups of coffee, which is two to 16 fluid ounce mugs is what they mean when they say cup, really eight ounces is a cup, so um, a day is fine. <laughs> Women who are pregnant or trying to become pregnant should consume no more than 200 milligrams of caffeine per day um, or two cups of coffee because higher level has been associated with potential risk factor for miscarriage or pre preemie preterm birth. So in case anyone who's out there who's pregnant or thinking about becoming pregnant, um, I know this is great news for me. <laughs> My husband begs to differ. He doesn't want me to drink any coffee. I mean, decaf still has a little bit of caffeine, so I'll definitely be drinking that. Um, but if you're a coffee drinker like moi, uh, you can have up to um, 200 milligrams. So that would be um, two cups of coffee a day. Is safe. You, and on the safest, safest is no coffee, so that's totally up to you how you wanna go about that. Okay, so one other thing I want you to remember for the test um, is this slide. With fre frequent use, tolerance develops, as with like alcohol. At higher doses, 600 milligrams, that means six cups of coffee or more, um, caffeine can increase nervousness, sweating, tenseness, upset stomach, anxiety, and insomnia. And um, caffeine can be mildly addicting, causing symptoms such as headache, fatigue, 
irritability, depression, and poor concentration, it peaks 24 to 48 hours after last caffeine intake. So even though you think, oh, I haven't had um, a coffee yet this morning, it's still circulating in your blood for 24 hours. That's pretty crazy, huh? All right, so we're moving into minerals. So you need um, small, only a small amount of mineral, a small amount of minerals, yeah, to perform very basic and important jobs. Excuse me, uh, important, not basic. Sorry. The percentage of minerals that is absorbed varies tremendously. Um, minerals in animal foods tend to be absorbed better than those um, in plant foods due to fiber and other substances that bind minerals. The degree to which a nutrient is absorbed and available in to be used in the body is called bioavailability. Sorry, I did not go over bioavailability in the last um, lecture because I know it did come up much sooner. Minerals are not destroyed in food preparation, um, but they are water soluble. So here's an example of major minerals and trace minerals. So major minerals we need more of, trace minerals we don't need as much of, um, with iron being the exception because we tend to not get enough iron. Um, just like vitamins, there is an upper limit. So there is such a thing as getting too much minerals, although that's very rare. Um, calcium is the most abundant mineral in the body. About 99% of calcium in the body is in our bones and teeth. The bones are constantly being rebuilt. But like I said, okay, here it is. Up to 90% of peak bone mass is acquired by age 18 in girls and by age 20 in boys. Uh, bone mass grows until you're about 25. So I apologize. In the last lecture, I said up to 25. I got the numbers confused. So ladies, um, we can still um, lay down more bone. Um, it just depends on genetics. But on average, we stop around age 18 and around age 20 in um, guys. Um, but bone mass grows until you're about 25. So there's still, if you're if you're in this age range between 18 and 25, I would still say make sure you get in a lot of foods that have calcium because um, it's a better chance of continuing. You never know. Maybe your bone mass is still growing, so it doesn't hurt. Um, women tend to experience bone loss after menopause. Again, I said hormones play a role. And remember I was saying vitamin D is one of those vitamins that can also act as a hormone. So all of our hormones shift and change, especially during menopause. So um, that's also a reason why women tend to experience osteoporosis. So calcium and phosphorus. Calcium in the blood helps to squeeze and relax muscles, send and receive nerves, nerve signals, and clot blood. And I bet a lot of people don't think about this, but calcium is even used in our heart, which is really cool. So I was just thinking about squeeze and relax muscles and send and receive nerve signals. All of that has to happen every single time our heart contracts. And as you know, if you put your hand over your heart, you're going to feel it. You're going to hear that heartbeat. You're going to feel that heartbeat. That is a contraction every single time. So we want to make sure that we are eating healthy and taking care of our heart. Um, but it's pretty cool to know that calcium plays um, a little role in that function. Um, phosphorus is part of DNA and needed for growth. And it buffs. It acts as a buffer for acids and bases. So it keeps our pH in our body balanced. That's also, I think, really cool. Um, I didn't mention this earlier. I'm going to probably get to it again, but remember when I was talking about the sports drinks, just so we're clear, um, that electrolytes include sodium, chloride, and potassium. So I would write that down. I apologize that I didn't make that more clear during um, when I was talking about enhanced drinks, sports drinks. So for the test, I do want you to remember that the electrolytes, when you hear the term electrolytes, and um, typically what, what's found in sports drinks are sodium, chloride, and potassium. So I do want you to remember that for the test. All right, so calcium is needed for strong bones. So we're going to go over this right here. Um, here are its function sources and special notes. So this is a table that's found in Chapter 7. Um, so there's a, a table that's found and it goes through a lot of the minerals. So I recommend if you're interested in that to continue reading that um, in the book. So calcium is important because it builds and rebuilds bones and teeth, squeezes and relaxes muscles, sends and receives nerve signals, clots blood, and seems to lower blood pressure. That's a really cool one. I 
Um, I believe potassium does this as well. And here are the sources that it can be found in. We typically say milk or milk products, um, calcium fortifi fortified soy milk, orange juice, cereal, and tofu. I tend to do that. Um, I tend to get my calcium from fortified um, orange juice. I'm, I think I shared with you I'm not a big milk drinker. So I have to find, I also do um, fortified soy milk. Um, I do eat tofu. I don't know if it's um, fortified with that. And I do eat cereal, but I don't know if it's fortified with calcium either so definitely get a lot of dark leafy greens that's for sure um just a little bit about phosphorus we already went over these functions um okay so magnesium about 50 percent of the magnesium in the body is in the bones um in the blood magnesium helps keep bones and teeth strong muscles and nerves functioning and the immune system working properly so uh, maybe some of you are interested like have done research in minerals maybe some of you haven't but I always think it's really cool when I'm doing these um presentations because it's a great reminder for myself just like how amazing the body is and just how amazing food is how it works in the body and nourishes the body it's just fascinating magnesium might also help reduce blood pressure and strokes so, so far I'm reading calcium, magnesium, and we haven't got to it yet, but potassium should be helpful in lowering blood pressure. And the only one that increases blood pressure that I've read is sodium, So, but we'll get to that. Um, here are some magnesium food sources, beans, nuts, and seeds, um, whole grain breads and cereals, milk, and yogurt. And then here's a nice little snapshot of that. So again, getting a variety. I like to include these pictures because I just really like um, how colorful they are and how there's a variety there and just to continue to encourage you just if you're eating a diet that has a variety of fruits and vegetables protein sources whole grains nuts and seeds legumes beans that you're going to get all the nutrition that you need and but the fresher the better the more whole unprocessed um, foods that you f that you eat, the more uh, often you're able to cook at home, the more likely you are going to get all of this great nutrition. So um, here's a nice little summary which of magnesium, which we already went over. So I'm not going to go over that again. Um, but you, it, this is just, I included it because it's a nice little summary of the other slides that I went over. All right, so we got to get into the nitty gritty sodium. So, okay, here it is. Okay, I could not remember if I put it in a separate slide or not. All right, so I want you to remember this for the test. Sodium, potassium, and chloride are collectively referred to as electrolytes um, because when dissolved in body fluids, they separate into positively or negatively charged particles. So any of you science people, which I am, as you know, sodium is a positively charged particle. Chloride is a negatively charged particle. And potassium is a positively charged um, particle. So sodium, potassium, positive, chloride, negative. So it's just kind of fun. They help maintain fluid balance and keep the blood neutral. So our blood pH should always be around 7.4. Um, so don't believe all the hype. If you drink alkaline water, that is not going to change your pH um, in your body because your body is constantly wanting to stay at 7.4. So if you, if your body was lower than 7.4, you would know because you would be sick. Something would be really wrong with your body. If you're not having any different kind of symptoms and you haven't been tested or diagnosed, then you probably have a normal pH in your blood and in your body. So don't pay extra money for those alkaline waters. They don't have an effect on your blood or body pH. And sodium is needed for muscle contraction and transmission of nerve impulses, but we're going to be talking about um, lowering sodium in the body just because too much sodium can lead to blood pressure is a risk factor for, and is a risk factor for heart disease. So salt does enhance flavor and texture and serves as a preservative. So when you're cooking at home, you are in control of um, sodium intake. Typically, high amounts of sodium are found in processed food and restaurant foods. Only 15% of sodium in your diet comes from salt added while you cook or is added at the table. Most of the sodium in your diet comes from, and when I say your, I mean mine, all of our, all of our diets come from processed and uh, restaurant foods. So when we say processed, we mean like instant foods like instant macaroni and cheese, instant top ramen, um, microwavable frozen foods. I mean, those kinds of processed Chef Poyardee, um, canned soups, I mean, those kinds of processed 
foods um, and restaurant foods are where the majority of our sodium comes from. So again, if we're able to cook from home, we're going to lower our sodium intake. So foods I want, I want you to know this whole slide because, and this whole slide, because I want you to be aware of the foods that are high in sodium and that will come up on the test. So I've gone over a couple, um, some other ones, maybe your, you or your family use bouillon cubes. I know my family heavily depends on it, so I had to help them move away from that. They sometimes still default to that and that's cool, but like using half the cube instead of a whole cube still is like a big win for me. Um, frankfurters, some people don't like hear about frankfurters like that. They typically think of hot dogs. Um, I don't know why in this slide and in this course we say frankfurters, um, but that's also another term for hot dogs. Um, so yeah, a lot of us who are into cured or smoked meats or fish, bacon, sausage, ham, um, and hot dogs or luncheon meats are really high in sodium, so we're going to have to figure out an alternative to those. I know because I'm a big deli meat person. I'm also a big cheese, not a big cheese person, but like when it comes to having charcuterie or um, trying different foods when I got to eat. I love to try different foods that have cheese. Um, so I'm, I'm in the struggle with you guys. We can have these things in moderation, just not every single day and maybe not a lot during the week either, you know, but in time, little by little. So other things that are high in sodium, I mentioned frozen foods or frozen meals, prepared mixes for stuffing. That's a big one, right? A lot of us engage in that on Thanksgiving, um, rice dishes, um, breading, salad dressing is a big one. I, I make my own salad dressing at home for that reason. It's always high in salt, sugar, and fat. So I just make my own salad dressings. Certain seasonings, soy sauce. Oh, I love sushi. That's a big one for me. I had no idea that I was like, oh man, soy sauce is super duper high. You can buy low sodium soy sauce. It's still higher, but at least it's better than regular. I think it cuts the salt, the sodium intake in half, if I'm not mistaken. Garlic salt, onion salt, MSG, um, seasoned salt, um, condiments such as Worcestershire sauce, horseradish ketchup, and restaurant foods. Here are some foods that are low in sodium, you guessed it, um, fresh or frozen vegetables without sauces, um, and if you do can't um, get no salt added, if you can't get no salt added, rinse it, rinse the fruit or the vegetables because fruit can be high in sugar if it's canned, so unless you get 100% juice, you can still rinse it to get rid of some of the excess sugar. Okie dokie. So fresh meat, poultry, and seafood are low in sodium, and then grains and legumes that are not processed or canned. So I take a take the time to compare the two. So you can see comparison of sodium in the two menus. I love doing this in class. I'm, I'm sad that we can't do it together. Um, but I just like to take the time to like show you what are some simple swaps that you can make. Um, to lower um, your diet that might be high in sodium and make it a lower sodium diet. I wish we were together because I make it more interactive. I ask you what differences you see. And also, I disagree with that soft margarine on the lower sodium size. No, no, no. We do not need soft margarine. If you want to use a little butter, that's cool with me because you're not going to use a full tablespoon, I don't think. Hopefully, you're not using a whole tablespoon on one slice of toast. Um, or use, or I recommend using a vegan vegetable uh, oil-based um, butter instead of margarine. No. Because remember, I said most margarines have partially hydrogenated oils, which is um, high, uh, which is uh, contains trans fat. So I don't want you, you guys using that. Tell your friends and family too. I've been working super hard to get my dad off of Country Crock, and it's been a struggle, as well as Coffee Mate. That's still a struggle. Okay, so I'm gonna continue, but I really want you to look at these and see what those swaps are that you can make because I asked, I've already asked you to do that in previous homework assignments and you guys are doing really good. Um, so these are just more examples for you to think about. And then um, I ask you to do something similar in, for your group project. So this is a really great comparison. Here's a picture of a high sodium diet. And honestly, before I was a dietitian, this looked like what my meals were. Honestly, going through college, this is pretty much what my diet looked like. So I've made a lot of changes since then, and I hope 
that you're inspired and encouraged um, through your degree and through this class um, that if you want to make healthy options, you uh, food choices, you totally can. So again, I said that I would talk a lot about um, sodium intake. So Americans overconsume sodium. It is high in processed uh, foods and restaurant foods, which can raise your blood pressure. And I want you to remember this slide for the test. Increased blood pressure is also a risk factor for heart disease, stroke, and even kidney disease, which a lot of people don't think about. But it is because our kidneys filter through everything. And so it's a lot of, it's, it's a, it can also lead to kidney stones, if I'm not mistaken. Um, sodium ad, adequate intake, um, 1,500 milligrams per day. So if we go back to this slide, you'll see that uh, a diet that's high in sodium was 4,200 4, milligrams or 4,200 milligrams of sodium. And then the lower sodium diet was 1,500 milligrams, 1,500 milligrams of sodium. So you, we all want to aim for eating a, a diet that's lower in sodium. So we're going to be looking at what's on the left. Also, I don't like that they include diet soda, but I guess they do that in case you're a person that likes soda. I'm just a proponent for no soda, <laughs> none, because um, studies show that even if we are to switch to diet products, which means products that are sweetened by sugar, uh, non-sugar uh, alternatives that it doesn't actually decrease our sugar consumption over time so I'm just a big no soda person and I'm all for soda on like special occasions or once a month honestly but if we're constantly having um, sugary beverages and sugary food intake then we're at risk for developing high triglycerides and um, I would not have known that um, had I not as a dietitian, experienced that myself, that's been the only thing I've ever been diagnosed with. I've never had high, um, I've never had high blood pressure. I've never had diabetes. I've never been a risk factor for anything, but I one time had high triglycerides. And then after that, I, because I also was like, Oh, I'll just have a, a juice here and there. I'll just have a soda here and there. And after three to six months of doing that, it showed in my triglycerides. So I just share that with you all. It's a personal experience and and I just want to be sure to pass that along to you because a lot of us don't monitor. Maybe after doing, uh, maybe after being in this class and having to track with your three-day food log with my fitness pal and doing the group project, maybe you'll um, be inspired and want to keep tracking your food intake um, but that's what I had to start doing after I had um, was told that I had high triglycerides and I had to start tracking my food intake to make sure that I lowered my intake of simple sugar beverages and foods. Yeah so the last thing on the slide remember I want you to pay attention to this slide for the test. Um, the dietary guidelines for Americans state that adults should lower their blood pressure. Oh, who want to lower their blood pressure should reduce their sodium to 200 uh, to the 2400 milligrams. Sorry, 2400 milligrams of sodium per day. Um, the average that Americans intake right now is 3500 milligrams. So all of us are probably walking around with high sodium. So it's a great place to start if you're not really like, oh, I don't want to make big changes. This might be a great place to start. In the past, I'd said. A great place to start would be hydration. I mean, it's really up to you where you want to start your health journey. So here are some great tips to lowering your sodium intake. And I recommend you taking a look at them when you are able. Um, but these are really simple, like getting unsalted version of nuts. Like I get raw mixed nuts um, because I don't like just one type of nut. Honestly, I'm not a huge nut person. It feels like I'm chewing on rocks. But I do it because they have healthy fats. Um, but I actually prefer unsalted. Um, I feel like there's more taste, more flavor when it's not covered in salt. So I actually really like that. Um, I really like pretzels too. Um, unsalted seeds, yes. Um, eating more fruits and vegetables, of course. Using herbs and spices instead of salt, like relying on salt, that would be great. And making your own salad dressing, yes, yes, yes. Choose less processed foods, eat out less, that will help. Uh, the DASH diet, it's 
high in fruits and vegetables, dairy and whole grains, which is what my plate is, and it's low in sweets, sugar sweetened beverages, bread and processed meats, and sodium. So there, these are other things you can look at in your diet if you want to make changes to make it healthier. Uh, this is just another game or like fun activity we would do, which food has more sodium. You can check that out. Um, so we didn't really go over potassium. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time here, um, but it does maintain fluid balance, con contracts muscle, and uh, sends nerve impulses. And I'm pretty sure it's also associated with lowering blood pressure potentially. Yay, here it is. There it is. Bullet point number three, functioning of a heart and regulation of blood pressure. Yes. So last uh, mineral I really want to spend time on um, is iron. So this is also because this mineral tends to be the one that Americans are low in, which is really interesting because this is um, this is a trace mineral, but somehow, some way, I guess we're not getting enough um, iron in. Um, iron is a key component of hemoglobin. It's a part of red blood cells that carry oxygen to the cells in the body. Uh, iron is uh, also part of myoglobin, a muscle protein that stores and carries oxygen that the muscles use to contract. Iron is also needed for the body to produce energy. Surprisingly, you store some iron in the liver and other places. Best sources of iron are meat, poultry, and fish. You can also, here's a really lovely picture. Um, I love that they included dried um, fruit. Um, like it looks like raisins, but it also looks like maybe dried mango, um, dried apricot. That's great. Um, so good sources of iron include meat, fish, and poultry. You can also get iron from whole grain and enriched breads and cereals, as well as legumes, eggs, dried fruit, and some leafy greens. Um, so I sincerely recommend all of these foods, all of this yumminess. Um, but if you're someone that's low in iron and under the recommendation of your physician and pharmacist, it might be better to start taking an iron supplement. Um, like, it, like our previous slide said, it is part of helping with, um, energy levels. So if you're someone who's been tired, uh, let, uh, fatigue lately, definitely look at all the options. Look at your diet. Look at how much sleep you're getting. Look at how much water you're drinking. Look at your diet. But also, you can get your blood work done and see if you're low in any vitamins or minerals. So for the test, I just want you to remember, or not just, I also for the test want you to remember this slide. So most iron in animal foods called heme iron is absorbed much better than iron in plant foods. I'm all for uh, a nice mixture of eating foods that... Um, meat products, animal foods that have iron, which is heme iron, and also plant sources, which have non-heme iron. I'm all about mixing and matching and getting both. Um, for the intents and purposes of the test, I do want you to remember that iron found in animal foods um, is absorbed better. So I do want you to remember that. And if animal foods on the test, you might see meat. So I want you to remember that. And the other thing I wanted you to remember is that the presence of vitamin C in a meal increases non-heme iron absorption. Um, so what that means is if you're, for example, having a salad with dark leafy greens because that is that has this, right, um, has iron, then make sure you have a, a glass of, which is eight ounces, a cup of orange juice. You can do that or you can have fresh oranges on your salad, which is also vitamin C. Um, so that's an example and I want you to remember that specific example for the test. Really any presence of vitamin C and what has vitamin C? Citrus. So really any, any foods that have vitamin C, I always remember citrus, that's just easier. But you want it, if you're low in iron and you're trying to increase, um, iron in your, in your diet and in your body, then you're going to want to eat animal foods and you all, and when you eat the plant sources that have non-heme iron, also better absorption of iron would be if you can pair it with foods that have vitamin C. I know that was really lengthy. Just think vitamin or just think iron plus vitamin C equals good iron absorption. That'll be, I think, the best way to remember it. So iron deficiency, um, only about 20% of dietary iron is absorbed in healthy people. Problems with iron deficiency anemia are more common in adolescent females. Yes, that happened to me. When I was playing sports, I had to do yearly physicals, and I um, was iron deficient, I think, every other year, sadly. 
So I learned early on foods that have iron in them. Women of childbearing age, because they need more iron, pregnant women need more iron and vegetarians. Um, and that's usually because they've cut out sources um, that have iron and they just need to increase the other ones or take a supplement. I mean, increase plant sources of iron and or take a supplement. Iron deficiency anemia, iron uh, stores become com severely depleted um, and causes fatigue, decreased work and school performance and, and even a decreased immunity function. This little slide combines everything we've talked about. This is really nice. Anything I talk about in any of my lectures, please feel free anytime to email me if you want to chat it up more, if you have questions. We're coming to the close. I'm going to be um, going through these relatively quickly. Um, please, I would say, slow me down if you need me to, but I don't suppose that um, you'll need me to slow down because this is now the cherry on top, just little extra nuggets for you, info for just for life, I guess. Zinc is in every cell in the body. It is a cofactor, a substance that is necessary for the activity of an enzyme. Um, so for nearly 100 enzymes, fun fact, so zinc is very important. Um, helps with making DNA, immune function and wound healing, growth and development, and taste perception. Interesting. Where to get iron? Uh, Protein-containing foods, especially shellfish, meat, and poultry, legumes, nuts, dairy, and fortified cereals. Hopefully you're seeing a trend that if you're eating a variety of foods, particularly similar to the my, my plate or the Harvard Healthy Eating Plate I showed you a couple lectures ago, then you're going to be getting all of these vitamins and minerals. Here's a nice little summary. Iodine is typically found in iodized salt. It's also found in um, I want to say it's also found in like mussels, oysters, clams. I want to say it's also found there, which would make sense. Um, yeah, so you can get iodine from other places. If uh, Most of us very rarely have an iron defi iodine deficiency. If any of us did have a severe iodine deficiency, we would develop what's called a goiter, um, which we don't really see uh, in America, and that's probably because we all tend to use iodized salt. So completely up to you if you want to continue using iodized salt. I know a lot of kitchens switch to kosher, kosher salt because Americans are not deficient in iodine. It's up to you. I have two or three different kinds of salts so I in my cupboard, so I just mix and match. Iodine is part of two important hormones that maintain a normal metabolic rate in your body and are essential for normal level of metabolism and normal growth and development. So here's just a little last culinary focus on nuts and seeds. Nuts and seeds have quite a few vitamins and minerals. They also have fiber and healthy fat and protein. So if you're vegetarian or vegan, got to get down on those nuts and seeds. Um, walnuts and flaxseed are rich in omega-3 fatty acids. Very cool. Roasting or sauteing nuts is a technique that enhances flavor by extracting the oils through heat. This results in a crisp texture uh, once cooled. Toasting nuts brings out the natural oils, adding uh, a rich, fragrant flavor. Uh, nuts and seeds turn rancid easily due to their fat content, so it's important that we store them in an airtight container or, um, in the refrigerator or in your cupboard, but only for up to six months. And I only say or in your cupboard because I've done that, um, but I do want to say that in the cupboard it's only lasted three months so maybe for if you're gonna have if you bought a lot like say from Costco you bought in bulk that would be the best way to go airtight container in the refrigerator so you have it for up to six months these are just different ideas for nuts and seeds chopping them using them in granola stews I've never done that in a stew, but maybe you have. Maybe you want to share that with the class or the recipe with us. Um, complex salad, sure, and breading. Um, for seeds, pumpkin, sunflower, sesame, and baking and cooking. Uh, you can add them to bread dough, pancake, or cookie mixes. Sprinkle seeds such as toasted sesame on soup. Soups, fish, and cooked vegetables. Very cool. I don't like nuts in my cookies, so please, if you were to ever bake me to any cookies, do not include nuts in my cookies. <laughs> um, black seeds need to be ground to get the benefits of the fat omega-3 fatty acid. Very cool. 
Um, you can use ground flax to enhance the flavor of oatmeal. We do that. So we add nuts and seeds to our oatmeal. That's just, I prefer that. Um, ground flax seed can be a substitute for fat or egg yolk in many recipes. Very cool. I never thought about doing that. Here's just a fun example of a variety of nuts. Here's a fun slide about a variety of seeds. And normally in class, I ask you to guess which is which. I'm going to ask you again, but I know that I can't hear your answers. And then this, this is just fun. Nuts in baked goods, added dimension and character, which I'm like, they do. All right, class, it has been so much fun. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture. I hope you got a lot out of it. And... Just know that everything we've gone over has prepared you for the test. Just to close us out, one final reminder for what's going to be on the test. Um, I've gone through a lot in this lecture, but just to have like a nice little um, tie the bow on the package, if you will. Water is needed in your body because of its many important functions. It's part of all your cells. It transports nutrients in the body. It carries waste out of the body. It's necessary for nutrient absorption, um, helps with metabolic reaction. So remember I said early on that I want you to really know that slide inside and out of all the functions of water. Yes, please do that. All right, have an awesome day and an awesome week, and I'm always here for you. Never hesitate to send me an email to chat with me during virtual office hours on Tuesdays from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, and Tuesdays 5 to 7 p.m. I'm here for you. We can do email. We can use the chat. We can also set up a Google Hangout if um, you're someone who need who would like that face-to-face -face interaction. I'm more than happy to do that. You just We just need a... I have a Gmail account, but I just need to make sure you have a Gmail account. Hopefully you do, because um, that's the only way Google Hangout works. And I would use something like Zoom or WebEx. I haven't played around with WebEx, but I know with Zoom, we only get like 15 minutes uh, free, and I don't want us to get cut off if we need a little bit more time. Alrighty, have a good one. I look forward to seeing you at the next lecture.